At this uh, ongoing series of conferences, we're giving a kind of introduction to ideas from our past. By our, I mean that these ideas were in the minds of our own ancestors, which is to say, we used to think in this way. But in these conferences, we're looking at ideas that are no longer familiar to us. If these ideas were not lost, we couldn't have such a conference. Would you really come here if we were just going to show you the origin of how you already think? But the things we're talking about are not common knowledge. As a matter of fact, never mind what the average person knows, what common knowledge is, these ideas are not known even to the people who study our past, the people who assume the role of teaching us about the very texts and works that are the focus of our attention this week, which is one of the things I want to show you this morning. These ideas have faded out, but not because they're about irrelevant things, as a matter of fact. They're about things we are profoundly involved with in our everyday lives. They are about still burning issues. They're about right and wrong, about worship, and so on. But we do not approach worship and right and wrong in these ways. And so the question is, since we don't look at things in this way, do we have a better way today? Or has some kind of damage been done? Has there been a war in which these things were damaged, wrecked, even laid waste? Is it true that the ideas faded out? Or did something happen to us so we faded out? Did we skip out on these ideas? Did we turn our minds to other things? Were we lured away by other ideas being so transformed in the process that we no longer perceived this scene as ruins, feeling a shiver of horror at what we see? All we saw here was garbage, and we said, let's clear this junk out of our way. Or, let's make a good use of it. But if you should want to recover these lost ideas, you will not find that easy to do. If you have the suspicion that some of our modern trouble comes from the damage to our past, from the destruction of ideas, what can you do? You can learn about the past. You can turn to experts who will restore the lost ideas. But what you must realize is that the experts belong to a world. Compare Western history to your own history, the story of your own life. If you understand your life as a process of growing up, maturing, putting away childish things, when you look back on, say, adolescence, you will do it with condescension. You are superior to your past self. You don't belong to that age you are recalling. That is no longer you. What you look back on as worth telling about that time is only what you today value. The rest is embarrassing. Anyone interpreting the past who sees his own age as superior to it, as having mercifully freed itself from those old childish notions, will interpret the past with condescension. What is good in the past is only what contemporary people value, what is harmonious with the present. And it might be that in certain ages, there is very little that is good. The past might simply be interesting. But it might be that we are not more mature today and that this condescension is fatuous. Wherever it has happened that instead of making progress, we have given up valuable ideas for worse ones, you realize that there are two different camps of historian, those who get what has happened and those who don't. Those who don't will often be condescending toward their intellectual betters. Now, why does this matter? Wherever what you are interested in, in history, is not simply facts, but ideas. You are never in a position to simply go to an expert because you don't know which kind of person this is. 
If we're interested in the Middle Ages, we might presumably turn to the BBC, where, as BBC publicity explains, leading authority on the Middle Ages, Professor Robert Bartlett, presents a series which examines the way we thought during medieval times." End quote. We know our medieval forebears from what they left behind. The grandeur of their castles, the beauty of their cathedrals, But medieval ideas are less familiar territory. Who were these people who lived a thousand years ago and built these extraordinary buildings and did these extraordinary things? How did they understand the world? What did they feel? And above all, what did they believe? Professor Bartlett might be, quote, one of the world's greatest authorities on the Middle Ages. But can you tell what he thinks of the Middle Ages? What he tells us is that they believed in dead men walking around and spreading disease. In other words, these are people who held quite bizarre beliefs. And we're certainly familiar with people who hold bizarre beliefs. The New Yorker recommended Philip Ball's book on Chart, which it praised as a book that evokes the cathedral's raison d'etre. Ball is a journalist, a decent writer who has digested and made accessible a great deal of academic writing about Chartres Cathedral. In this book, praised by the Christian Science Monitor, the London Times, the Wall Street Journal, I want to show you that the reality of the Christian past is kept closed to us by this text, by the historical accounts it communicates, by the interests of those disciplines. There's a great irony in educational exploits like Ball's book, this BBC series, and academic writing. It's an irony in these undertakings. A work like the cathedral in Chartres, in all its weight and color and presence, makes an overture to us via what it materially consists in, since it is a material thing. But it does not interpret itself. It is, in this respect, like a Bible, like a parable. And the irony is that people in our culture whose task it is to interpret, clarify, fill in for us the raison d'etre can do their work in such a way as to nullify these objects. When Professor Bartlett says, medieval ideas are less familiar territory to us than the beautiful cathedrals, is it your expectation that he will make them familiar? Well, what if he does this by translating medieval ideas into the terms of our time, using concepts like superstition, religious dogma, authoritarian power? Now these ideas are intelligible. Take Ball's subtitle, Universe of Stone, Chartres Cathedral, and the Invention of the Gothic. Ball explains that it is his purpose to say why Chartres Cathedral was built. That is, in the end, what this book attempts to do, he says. Can this cathedral be discussed and made intelligible in terms of how the Gothic style was invented? Of course, because the concept of a new style is perfectly intelligible to us. We understand the concept of a style and of a new style. If it's explained in that way, it has been made intelligible to us. But what has this got to do with Chart? The New Yorker thinks this is its raison d'etre. But in reality, this new style business has nothing to do with Chartres. If it is the case that Chartres embodies an idea that we have lost, the only way to make it intelligible is to leave our familiar territory. And the only sensible way to do that, in the case of a cathedral, is to look at what, indeed, it was made to do. The idea of a gatekeeper to the past, who is in fact a barrier to the past, is a brilliant invention worthy of, I don't know, the devil. If we want to know what a Gothic cathedral is, 
Is there any certain way to do this? In fact, there was a long-standing answer to the question, how to find out what something is. An answer had been given to this question. Aristotle had said that what a thing is, is what it is for. And that answer was accepted in the Middle Ages. If you wanted to understand a cathedral, you had to ask what a cathedral is for. For instance, what is the heart? And I mean the literal organ. In the Middle Ages, to say it is an organ of the human body was fine. But in fact, this would be considered a bad definition because it simply names the kind of thing the heart is. It gives the genus. It doesn't tell us what specifically differentiates this organ, the heart, from any other bodily organ. And to what do you think medieval logicians directed us to to find the specific difference, the thing that specifically differentiates this organ from others. The physical features. And then, once we have the unique physical features, we want to see what they do. What is it that these physical features are fit to do by virtue of their shape? In other words, their purpose. This is precisely the procedure we want to follow in answering the question, what is a Gothic cathedral? What is Chart? On the analogy of the bodily organ, what we need to pay attention to is the physical features and then what they are fit to do by virtue of their shape, their form. All the people who talk about the Gothic cathedral and the pointed arch or soaring height or the cross-ribbed vault or the flying buttress are indeed talking about the physical features of a cathedral. But these things cannot be the essential feature of a cathedral like Chartres. Why? All these, says a German scholar, are minor constructive means, but not ends. We want to know, what are they for? I'm spending a few moments talking about this before we look at the building, because I want to show you what is distinctive about teaching about a thing in the medieval way, understanding it in the ancient and medieval way by contrast with what is happening at universities today, what our experts are doing today. The medieval way involves essentials. What are essentials? The defining features of a thing, the features that differentiate that thing, an organ, from other organs. And those features you appreciate will be those that have to do with the purpose of that thing, that organ. This is not the way the modern teacher, writer, thinker looks at things. It is not the way they look at chart, not the way they look at the world, not the standpoint from which they teach. And it is a very decisive difference because it marks the difference between encountering reality and living in your dreams. There is a philosophy, a view of the world, that underlies the teaching at universities, the writing of books. We see it in this book. But we see it everywhere today. And just to make this very clear, let me give you an example from the newspaper. The Americans here are looking this difference in the face this month. The US Supreme Court is about to rule in June on marriage. Back to our what is question. The court is asked to rule on both the Defense of Marriage Act and Proposition 8, two acts of law that attempted to define federally and in a single state marriage as the union of one man and one woman. You can really see these laws and the opposition to them as a clash between the very two attitudes that I'm describing. One approach asks, what is it in terms of the features and purpose of the thing versus another approach? And what is the other approach, the modern approach? Well, let's see it by contrast with medieval thinking. Aquinas approached this same subject, marriage, by looking at what defines man and woman 
based on the fact that man and woman are labels tied to creatures that have distinguishing physical features that tend to do something. When two, one of each sex, come together, the origin of the one man and one woman idea, characteristically, you get offspring of this union, the origin of every citizen. What is the purpose of this union? It has both individual and social purposes. A committed union between one man and one woman serves to strengthen the family. These people stay focused on each other, devoted to each other. So there is, and this is an entirely factual thing based on just what we've said so far, a good marriage which does these things and a bad marriage which doesn't. And finally, this definition of marriage is counted a very important thing because the family, what it and it alone creates, is the essential building block of society, the state. Another answer to a what is question. So the approach is this. Begin with what things are, their distinguishing features, their purpose, their distinctive goods, and believe that by sticking to this reality, whatever you value will be served. Trust that we can have everything we need. But a modern person says, marriage is just a word. We can define it as it suits us. Now, don't set up a straw man. We don't want to do that. Aquinas would say that these modern people are not being flippant and whimsical. To define a thing as it suits us is always to define it in terms of good things that people seek. Equality is good. Justice is good. And I think we can agree with that. The modern approach, then, is this. Start with certain recognized goods and define things accordingly. Start with your sense that injustice is done and equality is violated if two women are not allowed to marry. Then work out what marriage ought to be accordingly. The modern person rejects the approach of Aquinas. He says, if you stick to what things are based on prioritizing their features and functions and order your society accordingly within those constraints, then two women or two men can't be married. So that's no good. I mean, they could have a civil union in which they would be granted hospital visiting rights and so on, but this wouldn't be treating their union as equal to that of the married. And we don't want that. In my America, do you see what is driving this approach? The primacy of your commitments to good things, like justice and equality, that you put first and then order things around. You define what things are secondarily to that. People say, I care about justice. I care about equality. And this is their starting point in definitions. Furthering equality is not bound to the assessment of what things are. Saying what things are in the way Aquinas did, Aristotle did, is an obstacle to your America. The very starting point of Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas is a barrier to achieving what you care about. So the Supreme Court justices, you appreciate, have to figure out how these two philosophies can be accommodated. And what should you appreciate about this? Justice is not, nor has it ever been, balancing the claims of two fundamentally opposed outlooks on reality. All justice has ever been is within one understanding of reality, according to one philosophical outlook, determining what is due to whom. It is ironic, then, what defect Ball sees in Augustine. He mentions Augustine at a certain point. He writes that Augustine's idea of education is no open-ended inquiry. Instead, its aims and conclusions are preordained, says Ball. But this is just the defect of the modern approach. If you absolutize your goods, equality, then it is likewise preordained that things like marriage will be whatever fits those absolutes. You never get away 
from absolutes. Ball writes, on the one hand, Augustine argued that it was essential to cultivate understanding of the world. But on the other hand, there was only one way this understanding was permitted to turn out. It had to be congruent with Christian doctrine, and so could hardly be a matter of genuine inquiry at all. Ball acts as if there is no modern doctrine that things have to fit. But of course there is. Your absolutes are set either by things as they are for a Christian, things as they are in the context of Revelation, or for the modern writer, by how you want things to be. Ball does not approach the cathedral from the standpoint of defining features and functions. Fundamentally, the cathedral was an organ, an instrument. And we will see how it is by looking at the structures of this organ. You might reasonably ask, was everyone in the Middle Ages taught logic? No, because right, this is uh, determining the, the nature of things on the basis of its essential features, not its accidental properties. Uh, you don't determine what a human being is, the basis of his hair color. Now, this is an aspect of logic in the ancient and medieval period, but not logic as it's studied today. Was everybody in the Middle Ages taught this? Is that what I'm suggesting? No, because that was not doable. But was everyone to be taught the essentials? That is the idea of a good society. Everyone may not be literate, but be sure that everyone learns the essentials. But how could that be done when people were not literate? The cathedral was an instrument of that teaching. I'm going to use the basic vocabulary for all churches, the features of the 4th century basilicas in the age of Constantine. Well, the basilicas are a form inherited from the Romans in any case. <coughs> and a place of assembly. <coughs> uh, the features of the 4th century basilicas are still present in the Gothic cathedrals and still present in many of our churches. The nave, the area of the congregation. The apse, the area of the altar. The aisles. And the transept, this is not a Roman feature. If you just look at it, you will see where this comes from. A second length of space that cuts across the nave at what is called the crossing, and that gives the church the shape of a cross. It was said by Honorius of Autun, a French theologian of the 12th century, the century of Chartres, that churches made in the form of a cross show how the people of the church are crucified by this world. The altar was at the east end, that is, the faithful facing the altar faced the rising sun. Honorius also explained that Churches are directed to the east where the sun rises because in them the sun of justice is worshipped and it is foretold that it is in the east that paradise, our home, is set. So what we will do then is to look at the north exterior of the cathedral, then the south exterior, and walk around to the west, the main entrance, and then we will go inside. You may find this a little bit arbitrary, but the builders at Chartres made a distinction between the lit side and the dark side of the building. A building in the northern hemisphere does not get equal light on both sides. A distinction was made between the subject matter to go on the north, the literally dark and sinister side, that is to the left of the main entrance, and the subject matter placed on the south, the side of the sun. This was not just an interesting idea. What is light? It is the dispeller of darkness, that without which all is dark. You appreciate, in line with things I've said about the medieval priority of important over unimportant, great over small, people would not have said, Light is really sunshine. They would have said, light 
this is in accord with what John's comment a little while ago, what is light? They would have said light is really Christ, the light of the world, who existed before the world and created the sun and came into our darkness. And so, says one scholar, according to medieval tradition, the north, the realm where light is paler and the sun burns less fiercely, is that which befits the Old Testament. The south, where light and heat shine forth, is the realm of the Gospels. So, Ball is quite correct to say the structure of a church encoded a set of relationships that mapped out the universe itself. When he adds, however, this is why it can be misleading to call medieval churches works of art at all, you notice that he is really saying, art does not do this. Yet why shouldn't it? If you walk from the west entrance around to the north, you find that the north porch, you, know, you find the north porch with three portals or doorways into the transept. So the end of the transept, you have a doorway with three doors. There's imagery all around the doorways. Above the doorways are bands of images called archivolts. Apparently, there are around 1,800 images carved into the stone of Chart. On every facade of the building, there are far too many subjects for us to look at. But what you have, this is just uh, the north facade, just these three doors. What you have on the north facade is scenes from the world before Christ, from the time of man's darkness. If we move west to east, we have in the main images above the doorways, Job on the dung heap. So right uh, behind the top of the doorway, uh, you see this area there. You see these images at this level. Tried by Satan. Then at the left, the incarnation of Christ. In the figures beside the doors, we have at right Old Testament figures, then patriarchs and prophets, and then the anticipation of Christ's birth. In the archivolts above the center door, just talk about that, images of the creation and the fall. In these archivolts at the front of the center portal, you have on the left side, as the arch goes up, the creation. Little vignettes showing the separation of the waters, the creation of animals, plants, the sun and the moon, the fish and the birds, and so on. On the right, you see newly created night and day, infants, one blindfolded. This is the creation of all of nature, the creation of man. Here is God with Adam. There are two faces side by side, man made in God's image. What a brilliant way to show this. I wish I could find a better image of this, but... Uh, Here's God making Adam. And with what extraordinary tenderness. No other religion that I know of imagines this kind of relation between man and God. And on the right side, as the arch comes down, you have the story of the fall. Adam and Eve in hiding. Adam and Eve condemned to work. Adam digging, Eve spinning. You see here the tympanum on the, of the right portal. Tympanum is the name for the flat area, like the skin of a drum, stretched between the arch and the lintel or the frame over the door. The scene on the tympanum is the trial of Job, who lies on a dung heap in the grip of Satan. According to medieval thinkers, Job, by his words and deeds, represents the person of the Redeemer. His wife who incites him to curse God exemplifies the depravity of the flesh. The figure of God who appears above him is his reward and consolation. So here you see, what else can this re remind you of? 
but Christ. Here you see the prefiguration of Christ. This is the center portal, still on the north side. Who are these figures to the left of the central door? The first holds a chalice and a censer and stands over the sacrificial lamb. The priest and king of Salem, the archetype of all priests, priest and king, Christ will be a priest in the likeness of Melchizedek. Next, Abraham preparing to sacrifice his son Isaac with the ram substituted for him beneath his feet. Christ will be the son sacrificed by the will of the father, substituted for man. Next, Moses with the tablet of the law pointing to the serpent of brass. In the book of Numbers, the Lord sent a plague of serpents to punish the Hebrews for their lack of faith. Then Moses interceded with God. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. Christ interceded for the life of the world. Though it was just that man was condemned to death. Jesus would come to say, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Moses is trampling underfoot the golden calf. Samuel with the Passover lamb. <clears throat> Christ is the lamb of God, the blameless and spotless one. David crowned, holding a lance. His other hand broken off. What was in it? It is believed he carried the nails of the crucifixion. Now why, would, why would this be? David carrying the nails of the, according to his prophecy in Psalm 22. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. Christ, in the line of David, will wear a crown, be pierced, and yet be king of kings. To the right of the door, you have figures from both Old and New Testament. <clears throat> from both Old and New Testaments, uh, who could be called confessors in that they all confessed Christ, testified to him, and knew him. Confession is not just <clears throat> a claim of belief, but a report, <clears throat> excuse me, but a report of your knowledge, <clears throat> your knowledge of Christ. Isaiah, prophet of the incarnation, who wrote. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is not just a prophecy, but acknowledgement that the one who comes will be God. Jeremiah prophesied the new covenant under Christ. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers. Simeon holding the young Jesus, acknowledging him as the Messiah. John the Baptist, who prepared the way of the Messiah and declared Jesus the Lamb of God. Peter, to whom the Father revealed the identity of Jesus as both, as both the Messiah and the Son. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The subject of the left portal is the incarnation of Christ the Annunciation, including the now headless figure of Isaiah, who prophesied it. This is the last area of imagery on the north side. Opposite is the visitation and the figure of Daniel. And we could go into the significance of all these things. What's the connection with Daniel? But all I want you to see is these appositions, where one thing is placed into connection with another. If Chart is a Bible. It is also a red Bible. So these scenes on the dark side of the church, so to speak, bring us up to the Incarnation, Christ's presence on earth, conceived of the Holy Spirit and a human being. On the north side, have we seen Christ? Only here in the Incarnation. What have we seen on this side of the church? We've seen a mirror of reality, God, nature, and history. 
While the later parts of Chartres were being built in the early 13th century, the Dominican friar Vincent of Beauvais, who died in 1264, was writing a big book that he called The Great Mirror. Vincent, in the 13th century, complained of the multitude of books, the shortness of time, and the slipperiness of memory, something we're all familiar with. His great mirror, or speculum maius, which is to say a mirror or reflection, a true image of the universe, would be the main encyclopedia used in the Middle Ages. But this is, in a way, a bad way to introduce it to you, because the encyclopedia, what do we think of when we think of an encyclopedia? A, nu a, a neutral ordering of neutrally described subjects. The encyclopedia is an Enlightenment invention. Beauvais' catalogue of knowledge was quite different. Philip Ball writes, as if the great thing about Chartres was how a new culture, unafraid of science, he says, and that did not, quote, devalue the physical world of human experience, and thus prepared the soil of the modern age, is given its most monumental expression in Chartres Cathedral. Well, what have we seen on the north facade? In fact, we have seen something from each of the three parts of Vincent's book, which was divided into the mirror of nature, then the mirror of instruction, and finally the mirror of history. What is the mirror of nature? It is a kind of commentary. Remember, this is an encyclopedia, the uh, main encyclopedia of the Middle Ages. The mirror of nature is really a kind of Commentary on Genesis 1 in 32 books. It opens with an account of the Trinity in its relation to creation and then presents the natural phenomena, just as that chart, in the order in which they were created by God. You have the days of creation, the four elements. Vincent talks about the minerals and vegetables and animals and the differences between them, but most important is the work of the sixth day to which Vincent gives most of his attention, the creation of man, as it was for man that all these things were made. Next came the mirror of instruction, the realm of morals. Again, compare this to an encyclopedia. <clears throat> Uh, modern encyclopedia will give you different uh, entry on different moral theories, but that is not what Vincent is doing here. This part of Vincent's book opens with the story of the fall. The most fundamental facts of man are his link with God and his fallen condition. We are condemned to death. The only remedy for this fate is redemption, and it is only through our Redeemer that this can occur. You might wonder how morality figures into this since we are chained to sin. But with the gift of the Spirit, can man not begin to raise himself? Aren't his God-given powers restored through his rescue so that man can learn what is right, subsequent to, his, to the beginning of his redemption? The mirror of instruction, therefore, is the category for both the liberal and the mechanical arts, but set that aside, so far we have seen the fall and man's lack of health. Finally, what is the mirror of history? The mirror of instruction diagnosed the human condition. We turn now to actual men and women and watch their progress in the work of redemption. The dominant thought of this book is the unbroken line of saints of the Old and New Testaments. Here you have all those known to history who have dedicated their lives to God. In other words, Vassal's book, as I think we could say, Chart's book, presented the world as the stage for creation and given man's calamity, the stage for his redemption, his recreation by a God who enters voluntarily into man's history to save man from himself. And by the last portal on the north, we reach the pivot of history, which is Christ. If we go around the cathedral to the south side, there is no east 
facade because the east wall curves around the altar, we arrive at the side of the sun, the side of life. Christ has arrived. Here we have in the main images above the doorways the last judgment at the center, which, with, sorry, with to left and right, scenes from the lives of St. Stephen, Martin, and Nicholas, in which Christ is given a central place. In the figures beside the doors, we have members of the elect at right, confessors, apostles, and martyrs. In the portals to the right and left, we have those who have in history borne witness to Christ. On the right side is a portal dedicated to confessors. Why are they called that? Because they confessed Christ, not with their mouths, saying, Lord, Lord, but with their lives. They bore witness to Christ in their lives. On the left side is a portal dedicated to those who bore witness with their deaths. So the doorway on the right, and then moving past the center, the doorway on the left. Confessors and martyrs. The scene shows uh, the vision, the scene of the tympanum shows the vision of the first Christian martyr, St. Stephen, who said he saw the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. The archivolts show more martyrs and their foes. Here's a man who has gathered a nice arsenal of stones for Stephen. <clears throat> the central port portal on the south transept represents the Last Judgment. In the archivolts, demons claim the judged. Others are resurrected and emerge from their tombs. Below Christ's feet, the archangel Michael is weighing souls. To the left and right, those who have been judged meet their fate. But what about this medieval idea of hell? Isn't this one of those ideas in the minds of our ancestors that we have mercifully put behind us? Old rubbish? Haven't we moved on from what we call this kind of thing? I have students who recoil from this idea of the Last Judgment. They say this kind of imagery to be a cliché. What a thing the human mind is. How do you apply the concept of a cliché to the representation of hell? I want to say to them, what do you think hell really is? Do you think it's going to be nicer? What exactly is your concern here? You want to do proper justice to hell. Let's not worry about the representation, about getting an image of hell that accommodates our taste. Let's think, as the sculptors wanted, about hell. Believe me, there is no conception of hell that you accept. It is all unacceptable. The elect to our left are received by angels. The blessed here are in the bosom of Abraham. Below, to either side of the door, are the apostles. And what do you expect to find in the doorway? The central doors of the south porch are double doors, and they open to either side of a stone trumeau, as it is called in French, a statue on the door jamb between the two doors. And on this trumeau, you find a unique representation of Christ. Some say that this was, in effect, a new conception of Christ in art, different from that seen in the East, that is in Byzantium. But I think it represents in stone, in three dimensions, something Byzantium avoided, some of the softer Byzantine icons of Christ. Here Christ has stepped down from the tympanum, as it were, to earth, into the midst of the congregation passing into the cathedral. Of course, it is God's coming down to earth, God taking our flesh. The three-dimensionality 
is an image of taking on flesh. Bringing Christ down in this way places Christ between the faithful and the last judgment on the tympanum above. You see here in this image, there's no writing here, but you see a quotation from Psalm 91 in which an explicit allusion is made in the form of the lion and the dragon under the feet of Christ. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. If you recoil from the fact, and that is what the fall on the north side has told you, that this is a fact that you in your fallen state are hell-bound, you might be disturbed by such an arrangement. Philip Ball calls the concept of original sin a doctrine of despair, Augustine's most insidious legacy. It's the very sort of verdict I was talking about at our conference on Augustine last summer. Some Christians say, some Christians say, against Augustine, that nothing is inherited from the fall. There is no original sin. There is just ordinary sin, regular voluntary wrongdoing. Babies become children who choose to sin of their own free will. No inheritance forces them to sin. But something forces them to die. They don't choose that. Death is the punishment for sin. And infants too young to sin sometimes die. So they have inherited something from this event. Did God create man mortal? Isn't death contingent on his disobedience? Well, what disobedience occurs incurs the death of infants. What, how can they dis disobey? I think Augustine was getting at something like this. But still you may find such an arrangement repugnant as Ball does, that you should inherit death and be damned but for the intervention of the Lord. Ball calls this a doctrine of despair, and clearly he rejects Christianity. He interrupts his account of Chartres to say the following, and at this doorway of Chartres, I think it's worth looking at his argument. Augustine, he says, <clears throat> and this is not Augustinianism that he's talking about, but Orthodox Christianity, Paul's understanding of the condition of man, Augustine, he says, provides a prescription for the harshest and most disheartening aspects of subsequent Christian theology, burdening it beneath a crushing weight from which only the humanism of the 12th and the 15th centuries offered some respite. Not only are we damned, and deservedly so, for Adam's transgression is ours too, but we can do nothing about it. Certainly, a man may lead a pious life in the hope of salvation, but that is conferred only by God's grace, bestowed on an elect for reasons of which we can know nothing. This grace, Augustine argues, is evidence of God's essential goodness. I think we can hear a gasp of irony there in that last line. Augustine never talks about this without a discussion of grace the gift of life. <coughs> I think Ball is reading Augustine well. What he doesn't understand is Chart. How is it crushing that God himself has come down from heaven, just as you see here, so as to offer deliverance to all, as he is doing here, blessing all who will receive with life? How is that disheartening? How are we trapped and can do nothing about our fate if all that is needed from us is to say yes to this rescuer? Ball believes he is recoiling from a bleak scheme of horror, but do you see this horror in chart? In fact, what he is recoiling from is the idea that he should need more than himself, that he should be in any such predicament whereby he would be doomed if not for this Savior, which he finds a preposterous idea. But how is that an argument? 
How do you reach the conclusion that is not the way it is? By starting with the premise, if it were that way, I would scoff at such a reality. Is that an argument? Young women lose their arms and legs to flesh-eating disease. People lose their faces, even, and all the help of medicine cannot stop it in time. Why not scoff at that? Which people also can do nothing about. Is it a doctrine of despair that there is such a thing as necrotizing fasciitis? But if you do not see the disease, this being a kind of disease that even when you see the evidence of it, you somehow cannot notice diseased conditions. Everyone looks the same to you, so that you do not even believe in the disease. Well, then, it will be very hard for you to acknowledge any savior bringing respite. So here on the south side of Chart, you are presented with several things. An image of your fate in eternity, which will be one thing or the other. And an image that, it so happens, is the first statue of Christ in cathedral sculpture to be carved in the round. That is to say, not attached to the wall, but separated, taking the form of a human body. Why is this the first statue to do this? Why does it do this? What is the purpose of this form? He takes, he takes three dimensions and comes down into your space because he did that and he is real. The Redeemer from death is among us. But I said when I started today that in these conferences we're looking at ideas that are no longer familiar to us and isn't all of this actually familiar to you? Creation, fall, incarnation, redemption, but the idea we're looking at here is the cathedral. Is it familiar to you? We want to say, yes, we've seen cathedrals many times in books. Some of you have walked through these places. But that wasn't really the question. You have seen the stone and the columns, but do you see the idea here? In fact, cathedral is the wrong name for this idea. Cathedral means the seat of the bishop, literally the chair in which the bishop sits but also the church in which he is the priest, serving his parish. There are cathedrals that don't look like this. The idea is of a building that does what this building does. What are the great buildings in our cities testimonials to? Is there any use of space, and I mean the use of civic space, the space in which a population, and by that I mean a mass of people who can be said to live together. So not the population of a nation, but that of a city or a town. Is there any use of space today that is comparable to this? And what are we and have we been seeing? A physical creation bigger than anything else and central not only to your town, but to your life. That is, it is always present and dominant. If I say, imagine a culture in which a giant book was built for you in the middle of your town. It was a 30-story book. It was visible from wherever you were in that town and sort of watched over you. And on a regular basis, you came to that book and read it. You could read it on the outside, and you could go right inside it and read wherever you turned. And this book spoke of the most important thing, and spoke of only that thing. No one put up any posters or filled it with any literature. It was all the literature it contained. It was the Bible. If I say, imagine such a culture, you are imagining this culture. It is Chart, or any of the other French, German, English cathedrals, you have nothing like this in any Greek or Roman building. There is no book that they present, no summa of reality in them. The Roman arch is dedicated to Trajan or Titus, though full of imagery, which is where the Gothic architects get this idea, are like single history books on the careers of one ruler. 
Shart is a summa of all the essential knowledge. In that respect, the cathedral is just like the Summa Theologiae of Thomas Aquinas. The word summa can mean the whole, but what summa means here is chief point or main things, the things that must be known. Says one Aquinas scholar, anyone who understands Chart, not merely as a piece of architecture, but as the attempt to give architectural form to the mystery of Christ as the liberator of creation, will perceive deeper meaning in the comparison of the Summa with the cathedral. The Summa is also attempting to give embodiment to an idea. Its structure attempts to express the structure of reality as a whole. If there were a building in Ottawa whose role it was to put that before our eyes, I would visit it regularly. It would be a place of constant pilgrimage. That I could go there to survey the order of things, you would find me there every week. And isn't that the idea of a physical church? I know that I'm taxing your ability to sit in one place, but we have not yet gone into the cathedral or even around to the last, last facade, and there are two things that I have not said that I want to touch on. So moving a little more quickly, if we walk around to the west, we're looking at the so-called royal portal, the main entrance to the church. You have three doors leading into the nave at the center. In the center tympanum is the major image of the main entrance, Christ in majesty flanked by the symbols of the four beasts of the apocalypse representing the four gospels. What we are seeing is Revelation chapter 4, John's Revelation, from which I will read. After this I looked and behold a door was opened in heaven. And there is a door here. And a voice said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And there was a rainbow around about the throne. The archivolts that you see over every door have the form of that rainbow. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Bear those words in mind as we go through these doors. Do not forget that image of a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. These are the evangelists. The lion and the calf, the four-footed beasts, that are at the bottom, connected to the earth, are the most straightforward of the Gospels. And then the man, not an angel necessarily, but a winged man, and the eagle represent Matthew and John, John the eagle, since John's Gospel flies the highest. Standing here at Chartres, where are you? You are being transported in imagination to the day of judgment, yet not as you were on the south side of the church facing judgment. No, after your judgment, here you are standing before your God, ready to enter your home with him in eternity. Standing before the cathedral, your imagine is being stimulated. You are being shown things which must be hereafter. You're being induced to imagine that the door before you is the door in heaven, and you are hearing the voice of Christ telling you to come up hither. In fact, the entire cathedral has been doing that because it has been speaking with the voice of the Spirit to you. May you have ears to hear. The task of the cathedral is to show you the order of things, the order in which you have a part, and to give you a foretaste of the celestial city that is your true home, no matter who you are. 
So you appreciate that as we walked around from the south side, the center portal in the south, as you go around to the right here, the Last Judgment. So if you're facing the Last Judgment, on which side are the damned? They're on the right. So if you walk in the direction of the saved, you continue around to the west facade and you are standing before these doors, ready to enter your home. Some students say, I don't really like this image of Christ. They don't really like the west facade of Chartres. Yes, not every icon is appealing. The specifics of the shaped image, the expression of Christ's face, might seem to be the essence of the work of art, right? What is actually materially there? But isn't there something going on here? Isn't there a voice that speaks over the human frailty, speaks louder than the not exactly perfect diction of the shaky poet, and yet something comes through, something speaks through his less than perfect words. You have here on this facade the hope of the psalm, Psalm 118. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I shall enter through them. I shall give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. Below Christ are the 12 apostles, the first disciples associated with this vision of order, flanked by two prophets thought to be Enoch and Elijah. Notice that you have groups of three and then single figures on both sides. Why do you think Enoch and Elijah? They didn't die. Figures who were received directly into heaven without death. Before we move on, recall that this is the major image. Where is God the Father? Historians in the past were baffled by the absence in medieval churches, and of course we're talking about the past later than, more modern than, the Middle Ages, baffled by the absence in medieval churches of images of God the Father. You see this quite a lot in the Renaissance. But in the celestial city we're witnessing here, God the Father and Christ are united, as in Revelation 21. The Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple. The Trinity is together in its unity, and they are the temple. The right-hand tympanum, if we move to the right doorway, shows the infant Jesus Christ seated on the lap of the Virgin. So far, we have not seen many images of Mary. Ball quotes Henry Adams, an American who wrote a famous book about Chartres in 1904, who said, if you are to get the full enjoyment out of Chartres, you must for the time believe in Mary and feel her presence as the architects did in every stone they placed and in every touch they chiseled. This is an odd comment. Doesn't every Christian believe in Mary? But you might say some Christians believe Mary to be what she isn't. So is Adam saying to get the full enjoyment out of Chartres, and notice that word, you have to have false beliefs about Mary. We should look at this because Chartres is dedicated to Mary. Its name, like the name of most cathedrals in this period, this is another cathedral, Mont Saint Michel, its name is Notre Dame de Chartres, Our Lady of Chartres, the Virgin Mary. Ball writes this. Like countless other churches in France, the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Chartres is a temple to the Marian cult of the Middle Ages dedicated to the Mother of Christ. In 876, Charlemagne's grandson gave to the Bishop of Chartres the tunic said to have been worn by Mary at the time of the birth of Jesus, which Charlemagne, Charlemagne had been given by a Byzantine emperor in the 9th century. <clears throat> this tunic, says one call, scholar, was probably the most venerated relic of Mary possessed by Christianity. But set aside the question of relics and consider Mary. The Gothic age, the 11th and 12th centuries, 
centuries, <coughs> 11th, 12th, 13th centuries, is a time of what is always called the cult of Mary. What does cult mean? You probably know that it means following, the group of followers who are behind a leader. Here the leader is Mary, the mother of Jesus. But many of you will cringe at that. Mary is not my leader, you say. I am a Christian dedicated to Christ, a follower of Christ. And one of the things I think we should touch on before leaving Chartres is precisely this. In this tympanum on the west, we're seeing a specific kind of image of Mary, Mary as the throne of Christ. There is a medieval tradition of understanding Mary as the seat of wisdom, the Sedes Sapientiae, which is what we see here. So you're looking on the left at one of the earliest icons uh, still in existence from the 6th century. In the history of Christianity, and even before the Reformation, Christians have always been sensitive to any derogation of Christ's glory, any diminishing of Christ. Why should Mary present Christ? Surely, you might want to say, you might want to say Christ presents himself. But let me put two images side by side. Mary, the seat of wisdom, and this Byzantine image of the Trinity. Look at the icon on the left. How is the Trinity represented here as one? This image presents the Trinity as one. What does it do to do that? One on one throne. And also you notice the outline of one is contained within the other. In the image of the seat of wisdom, you have the same representation. One throne and the outline of one figure is contained within the other. Of course, here this does not mean exactly the same thing as in the Trinity, but Christ was within Mary, who bore him. Here, however, he is born, yet the significance is clear. Having Christ within is a key idea in the New Testament. And it is precisely this that is the mode of the rescue. Paul writes in Romans 8, Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Christ is in Mary, and Mary is in Christ because of him. Paul writes, because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. Notice this, you. Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. What can be said of Mary is said of you, because Mary is the first Christian. Mary is the first to say yes to Christ and says it even before he is conceived. As Augustine says of Mary, she conceived him in her heart before she conceived him in the flesh. If Mary is the first human being to say yes to Christ, then she is the first follower. And so she is the leader of the church in that one sense that, issue, that is at issue here. The church, the body of the faithful, followed her in time, joined her. Mary is an image of the church of every Christian. As for the idea of wisdom, who here is wisdom? The answer to this should be clear from what we've just said. Christ is wisdom. He became to us, Paul said, wisdom from God. He became wisdom to us, by coming to us. And so one writer says, as wisdom incarnate, Christ is seated on the lap of his blessed mother. Mary is the throne from which Christ rules the universe. The throne of his incarnation, the vehicle of his assuming our flesh. Mary is the seat of Christ who is wisdom, but the promise is that he will be in us. Wisdom will be in his church. 
And that is what we see. In a book written just before this facade was built, Hugh of St. Victor wrote, there are two works that include everything whatsoever, the work of foundation and the work of restoration. So what is he talking about? Two works in the universe. There are two kinds of work, the work of foundation and the work of restoration. That is to say, your work is one thing or the other thing. The former, he writes, is the creation of the world with all its elements. The latter is the incarnation of the word with all its sacraments and everything that could be informed by that. For the incarnate word is our king who came into this world to fight the devil. And all the saints who were before his coming were as soldiers going before his face, he writes. The statues flanking the doors on the west, which flow across from one side of the facade to the, to the other, almost like soldiers at attention, are these figures, ancestors and precursors of Christ, who foretold his coming, all solidly made part of the kingdom. Here we see them not, as on the north, before Christ's coming. Here we see them received into heaven. Hugh then mentions those who will come after unto the end of the world are as soldiers who follow their king. This includes Mary and, God willing, us. Those who stand and gaze on this building. What is shown here on this entire facade, all three sides, is the story of history, the history of the world. In the unfolding of this grand design, everything else paled into insignificance beside the overwhelming fact of the Incarnation. The coming of Christ into the world was the one truly decisive event in history. It divided time, as this cathedral says. So this is an order in which we are included, as Christians standing before this door. At this point, I don't want to say very much. We should finish inside, because we have still yet to go in. No other Gothic cathedral has been able to preserve its original glass, which in this case amounts to a hundred or so windows dating for the most part to the beginning of the 13th century. You can see most of the internal elements of the cathedral here, the nave at the center with the lower aisles at the sides. In the foreground is a prayer labyrinth, a path that you proceed through in a sequence of prayers. You pray bodily, so to speak. One might say, but why a repetition? Why a repetition of prayers? Your whole life is, or ought to be, a repetition of prayers. No matter where you go on this labyrinth, this way, that way, to the north, to the south, prayers that you might go at all times in one direction, to one end. You notice it leads to the center. It's not a maze, but a labyrinth. There is one track to follow, no choices as to which way to go. And of course, are the rebellious sons of man here that no choice as to which way to go. They want to tear their hair out. But that is, we see here, the one way, harmonious with this place, the one way to move through space, the created world, this life, in one way only, a life, you notice, of constant turning around. Here we've turned back toward the entrance, and we can see the arcade, the row of large arches at the bottom, and the clear story, row of windows along the top, the vaulted ceiling, the architectural forms seem graceful, almost weightless compared to the massive solidity of earlier medieval churches. The windows have been enlarged to the point that they are no longer openings cut into the wall. They fill the wall area so that they become translucent walls. Suger, the abbot of a cathedral that inspired the builders of Chartres, had the following statement carved into his church. Now the magnificent work, inundated with a new light. Suger was thought to be the innovator 
of this idea of a wall of glass. And once he had built these windows and changed the structure of uh, the choir of his church, he, he wrote, now the magnificent work inundated with a new light shines. Now the center of the sanctuary gleams in its splendor. And think about this. What is the center of the sanctuary? It is Christ on the altar, sacrificed. In Sujay's church, there was a large cross. This new light is caused by the death of Christ, the light that's given to us. In every truly Gothic cathedral, light floods into the apse or choir, the area of the altar, which is surrounded by windows. The choir, Sujay said, was inundated with a new light. And this light is, of course, divine. It comes from heaven. The people who were sitting in darkness, Sujay wrote, saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. Those are the words of Christ from Matthew 4. Sujay is also citing Isaiah, who had said, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. And it is light that makes all the imagery of the windows visible. To know anything about this cathedral is to know what it is for. Chartres is an image, a representation into which you can enter. It is not a building, an envelope of space in which we do things. It is something in which something is done to us. Ball does not approach the cathedral through its function as an image of heaven, but how could he? And yet to provide an explanation of a thing that you cannot explain leaves the thing closed. There is much that you can learn from a book like this, but the reality of the Christian past is kept entirely closed by such texts, kept closed by the interests even of historical disciplines. The cathedral is a machine for understanding material being and reorienting ourselves within this world. It is a compass for this world. One of the names for Mary is dwelling place of light. The cathedral dedicated to her is a dwelling place of light. Chart is a finely made instrument, a meticulous construction of glass and stone designed to reveal the meaning behind the actual physical light that dawns each day, the light by which we see everything, the true light who is Christ. To quote Abbot Suger, the dull mind rises to truth through that which is material and in seeing this light is resurrected from its former submersion. The builders of Chartres have simply used matter to lift our minds out of their darkness. The builders of Chartres have used matter in imitation of God creating the universe so that what they made would likewise declare the glory of God. It is an instrument of witness. Where today is the biggest building put up in any town or city? A building that testifies to the truth. A building meant to lead every citizen to the truth. The idea that Chartres belongs to the Middle Ages, that it was created for now dead people and is therefore a relic of something past, the manifestation of unfamiliar thoughts is utterly false. Chart was built for those in darkness. The Gothic age is over, but what Chart was saying in the year 1200, it is still saying to those with ears to hear with the very same eloquence. Thank you.